Welcome to The Metabolic Link, a medical and science-focused podcast that explores the common thread of metabolism in health and disease. This is where science meets society. Welcome back to another episode of The Metabolic Link. Today, we're sitting down with Dr. Chris Palmer to discuss environmental contributors to mental illness, the role of nutrition in mental health, how mental disorders can affect longevity and aging, and much more. Dr. Palmer is a psychiatrist and researcher working at the interface of metabolism and mental health, who has been pioneering the use of medical ketogenic diets in the treatment of psychiatric disorders. This interview was recorded in partnership with the Charlie Foundation at Metabolic Health Summit 2022. Thanks for listening, and we hope that you enjoy. My name is Chris Palmer. I am a psychiatrist at Harvard Medical School and McLean Hospital. I'm the director of postgraduate and continuing education there and an assistant professor of psychiatry. I, you know, most of my career has been spent doing research, education, and clinical work. So I've been lucky in that I get to do all three things. My day job at the hospital is actually education. I'm an educational administrator. Um, And my hobby over the last uh, probably 10 years in particular has been uh, pioneering the use of the ketogenic diet in people with treatment refractory mental illness. I came upon a lot of this through serendipity, quite honestly. I went on a low carbohydrate diet over 20 years ago for my own metabolic health because I had metabolic syndrome when I was only in my 20s. Lo and behold, I improved my metabolic syndrome. My blood pressure went down, my cholesterol got better, everything got better. Um, But the thing I noticed was that, gosh, I have more energy and motivation. I feel great. I'm sleeping well. This is really weird because I've never been like this in my whole life. And I started to wonder, I want, you know, could this help some of my patients with treatment-resistant depression who've tried dozens of medications, even ECT, years of psychotherapy, nothing's working for them. And so about 18 to 20 years ago, I started using it in them. Lo and behold, it worked for some of them. Not everybody was able to do it, didn't work for absolutely everyone, but it was working. But at that point in time, the low-carb ketogenic diet was even more controversial than it is even today. And so I kind of kept it under the wraps. And then about six, seven years ago, I had a long-standing patient with what's called schizoaffective disorder, which is a cross between schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. And I, he wanted to lose weight. So I told him, let's try the ketogenic diet. I was really only trying to help him lose weight. I had no other hopes or ambitions. If you had asked me, do you think the ketogenic diet might do something for his psychiatric symptoms, I might have said, well, it might help his depression or something, kind of like I noticed, but he's got a very different disorder. He's psychotic. He's disabled. Um, He clearly has a serious brain disorder. There's no way it would do anything for that. Um, And lo and behold, within about two weeks, I noticed profound antidepressant effects. He started making better eye contact with me. He was chattier. He was happier. He was engaging with me in a way that I'd never seen. I was like, oh, this must be that antidepressant. Like, I've never seen you this way, but you're just getting less depressed. About four weeks in, he said, you know those voices that I tell you I hear all the time? I'm like, yeah. He said... They're getting quieter and kind of going away. In about six to eight weeks, he had long-standing paranoid delusions. He was convinced that there were these wild conspiracy theories against him. There were these wealthy families who had all the technology in the world, and they targeted him, and they could read his mind, and they could put things into his head, and they were torturing him. They, they were just torturing him. He wasn't quite sure why he was a target but he was convinced he was a target. Um, And he said, you know how I've had those thoughts? And I'm like, oh gosh, we're gonna talk about that again. Um, And he said, I think, I don't know if that's true anymore. I think it probably isn't true and maybe never was. Maybe I've had schizophrenia all along. And That, for me, was profound. So that particular man went on to lose 150 pounds, 
and has kept it off to this day. He was able to move out of his father's home for a period of time. He was able to perform improv in front of a live audience, which would have been impossible for him. He couldn't ride on a public bus. He was so paranoid and terrified. He couldn't go to a movie because he was worried that in the dark, the people who were out to get him would get him. And he became a functioning member of society again who was much less tormented by symptoms. He, his symptoms never went 100% away, but they were dramatically better. And that made me kind of relaunch my interest in this and... Um, you know, at that point, I kept my regular day job, but increasingly it became more and more of an academic hobby. So I started collaborating with researchers around the world, started pe speaking about this actually at conferences around the world. I was publishing articles in both academic journals and uh, in the lay press and building momentum. And at the same time, I started treating patients. The fortuitous thing is that I quickly learned, oh, the ketogenic diet is an evidence-based treatment for epilepsy. I had no idea. I never learned that in my training. Oh, we use epilepsy treatments in psychiatry all the time. Oh my gosh, when I look at all the neuroscience that's known about the ketogenic diet, this makes perfect sense about why it might help somebody with schizophrenia or bipolar disorder. It makes perfect sense. And so all of that has been included in my presentations. And increasingly, we are um, building a tremendous amount of momentum of interest around this. An interest in, yeah, that Chris Palmer, he just pointed out all this obvious, why isn't anybody using the ketogenic diet? It's like, why haven't we been using it? If it's an evidence-based treatment for epilepsy, what's going on? Kind of to fast forward to today, that was the start for me. That, that has not at all been the end. It was an extraordinarily important clue to me as an academic psychiatrist and a researcher who for years have been questioning what causes mental illness and how can we develop more effective treatments. Because our current treatments fail to work for far too many people. And right now, we, nobody can answer the question, what causes mental illness? We know risk factors. We have clues, like neurotransmitters are involved, but stress and genetics and hormones, um, childhood abuse, drug and alcohol use, all of these things are involved, but nobody knows how they all fit together. So when I had this additional clue, somehow the ketogenic diet is doing something that's reversing a chronic mental disorder. I felt like this is kind of a goldmine clue because I'm reversing the illness. I'm getting people completely off all psychiatric meds and they are remaining well and healthy. And, you know, the most striking case was a, a woman who at the time, she was 70 years old, started had had schizophrenia for 53 years, was obese, had a guardian, suicidal, multiple suicide attempts. She was schizophrenic in every way we think about schizophrenia. And schizophrenia was ruining her life like it does for millions of people. And she went to Dr. Westman's weight loss clinic and tried a ketogenic diet and got completely better in the same way. And she lived for about 14 years after that, symptom-free, off medication, no more hospitalizations, no mental health professionals. So that was another piece of the clue for me, is that even after decades, we can somehow reverse this illness using a diet. And it sent me on a path to explore everything that I knew in neuroscience, in psychiatry, in the mental health field, but also having to dive into what do we know about diabetes? What do we know about obesity? What do we know about metabolism? That ultimately led me to what do we know about mitochondria? And 
I set out on a journey to see if I could somehow put it all together and make sense of it. And that, in my mind, has been the remarkable, shocking, unbelievable thing for me, is that I believe I have developed a comprehensive theory of what causes mental illness based on metabolism and based on mitochondria. And it will help us understand actually all of the things I mentioned. How do neurotransmitters and hormones and stress and childhood abuse and drug and alcohol use fit together? How can we understand them? How can we understand all of the risk factors for different mental disorders? How can so many different risk factors, one person has a family history, but no childhood abuse, has had a perfectly healthy, good life, but then develops a serious mental disorder. Whereas somebody else has had some infections, started using drugs and alcohol, and they developed the identical disorder. How is it that different risk factors lead to the identical disorder? And the only way to put them all together is that we have to go all the way to the level of metabolism and mitochondria. And once we do that, the dots of mental illness can be connected. If you want to take care of your mental health, you have to take care of your metabolic health. But it goes the other way, too. If you want to take care of your metabolic health, you have to take care of your mental health. And some people don't have total control over their mental health. They might be in an abusive relationship. They may have experienced trauma or abuse as a child. And they don't have control over that. So by no means do I want, ever want my message to be interpreted as everybody can control their metabolic and mental health easily by just going on a diet. It's not easy, and it's not just a diet. It's um, it's stress, it's sleep, it's appropriate use or reduction of drugs, alcohol, smoking, um, but it's also things like loneliness, purpose in life, all of those things. But I would say that everybody who's interested in living a healthy life, a vibrant life, needs to really focus on their metabolic and mental health. And that can mean different things for different people. So one person might be following a great diet, be relatively thin, and exercising regularly. But if that person's also a heavy smoker and has erratic sleep schedules, I would say that person needs to focus on let's get rid of the smoking and let's normalize your sleep. Prioritize your sleep, recognizing how important that is to your both metabolic and mental health. Somebody else, a lot of people in this country, unfortunately, might benefit from dietary interventions because they aren't metabolically healthy from a weight standpoint, from a type 2 diabetes or insulin resistance standpoint, from a triglyceride standpoint, an HDL standpoint. And all of those things are markers of metabolic health. They also increase risk dramatically for mental disorders. So for example, women who have metabolic syndrome, eight times more likely to develop bipolar disorder. And so for if you're a woman who's got metabolic syndrome, I would say if you want to live the best life you can live, it's important for you to focus on a comprehensive metabolic mental treatment plan. And diet and exercise are key but there are all the other factors that I mentioned. A lot of times, you know, I get this question, like, well, is life worth living if I have to give up pie or if I have to give up cake or ice cream? Why bother living if I'm going to have to give up ice cream? And I usually, you know, I usually have a conversation with them, and sometimes it's a series of conversations over a period of time where I let them understand that you are currently, quote unquote, addicted to these foods. And so it can seem impossible right now to live life without them. And it, it, I'm sure it does seem like you will be miserable without those foods. I was like you once. I remember that. I remember thinking, there's no way I want to give up all these foods, certainly not for life. 
when I started the diet, I started it for just a few months. I was gonna get my metabolic markers under control and then I was gonna go back on my regular diet, of course. Like, why would I change my whole life for metabolic health? Like, that would be silly. Of course, everybody, every time I went back to the regular diet, the symptoms would come back, metabolism would get worse, mental health would get worse, everything would get worse. And I can honestly say at this point, having done this for over 20 years myself, it gets much, much better, usually about six weeks. Give it six weeks is what I tell people, and the cravings start to go away, the desire for your comfort foods starts to go away. And when you begin to experience the improvement in metabolic and mental health, it becomes a no-brainer. It just becomes almost a requirement that you're going to continue doing this because as you said, you do have more resilience, but you have more capacity. You have more capacity for everything. So if you want to be a hard worker, you have more capacity to be a hard worker. You can be more productive. You can think more clearly. You have more energy, motivation. You have more determination and perseverance. If you want to be a family person or a friend person, you're going to be the friend who doesn't just show up and plop on the couch and just sit there and say, let's watch TV together. You're going to be the friend who's planning activities, things that are really meaningful, things that you'll remember for years to come. You're going to be have enthusiasm. You're going to be able to open up. If your friends want to kind of vent to you, you'll have the resilience to listen to them vent because you're strong and healthy and you can help absorb some of that and help them cope. And I have to say, I can't imagine myself ever going back to a state of poor metabolic health if I can do anything to control it. And it is just a different life. One that I, you know, when I was 20 years old, I would have said that's impossible for me. Um, you know, I, I remember thinking that there are these people in the world who are happy, peppy people, and they talk about wanting to work hard and play hard. And I always got the work hard part. I was a hard worker. I was disciplined. I wanted to be responsible and go somewhere. And I got through college and medical school and was a hard worker. I could never for the life of me understand the concept of playing hard. Who wants to play hard? Why? I, who's got energy for playing hard? It's so hard. Like, I'm so tired. <laughs> I'm so exhausted. Who's got energy for that? That, uh, and after I changed my metabolic health, I became a happy, peppy, work hard, play hard kind of person, something that I would have thought was impossible. Thanks for listening to this episode of The Metabolic Link. If you're enjoying this podcast, please share, subscribe, follow, and leave us a comment or review on whichever platform you use to tune in. We hope you'll join us next time.